So welcome to the Interim Whisper, the show all about the future of work and innovation. Today's Interim Whisper tip of the week is be sure to review the final task, the tech stack, and also any of the skills that the students have earned during their internship so that they can share on their resume. You guys have signed off on that. Today's guest is Jim Faraday. Hello, everybody. Yep. And he is with Orlando World Live. He is the actual show king. But enough about that. He'll tell us about that later. Jim. Yes. Five words that describe you, and you can even use just one. Um, fearless. I like that word. I'm I've always been it. fearless because when you do what I do, um, they always say be a concert promoter is one of the most idiotic, stupid jobs that anybody can do because it's 90% risk, 10% reward. Mm. And the risk, what is the, uh, the risk comprised of? Money, time, relationships, all of those? <laughs> Everything, the, the 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 crowd, the no one showing up. I've done national acts where I sold three tickets. First time I did Kid Rock, Kid Rock I sold no tickets. And, Kid Rock, wow. But I was doing a lot of bands before they were known. So when you do wow. stuff like that, it's terrifying. When you are in a situation or weather, I did George Benton outside and there was a massive hurricane coming into Orlando. And so you're always, you're, there's a million moving parts to the right, you know, stagehands not showing up, the sound getting blown out, the ceiling falling in at the Beecham Theater. There's there's a million factors and you got to keep moving and adjusting. Has all of that happened where the ceiling fell in on the Yes, Beecham? on Tori Amos' show I did, yes. Oh my God. That or, the, or, or the lead singer can't wake up and thinking, can I really pull this off by putting on a wig and maybe do his part? I'm not sure. Are you a mu- musician also? Zero. I can play the the, the block. That's about all. That's all I, got. I never got <laughs> past that. Not even cowbell. I'm not okay. Sure. <laughs> That's interesting. Well, fearless, I would I would say yeah, because uh, from what I've learned about you in the short time that you know we've been able to get to know one another, it's um, yeah, that would be it. Because it does, it takes a lot of guts. We well, have to it. think on your feet. It's like being a restaurant owner, which that's where I got my training. There's so many moving factors at all times, and, mm. you know. So you're always you got to adjust to the situation very quickly or things could go south very quickly. That is true. So what did you want to be as a child? Did you have a dream? Um, not really. I just, I, my father was a, a young entrepreneur. Both my parents were high school dropouts and they were always just do whatever you wanted to do. I used to be a horrible high school student. I bring C's on there like, eh, still in school, that's a win. <laughs> so I, they let me venture off and I was very entrepreneurial at a very young age and coordinating concerts when I was 16, 17 years old. And I just became a lifelong, you know, concert promoter by getting a taste of it very early. So um, one of the things I did, I was a teacher at a high school, Lake Mary High School, Lake Brantley. And then at Lake Mary, I was the prom sponsor. We had to raise money for the prom. So I went, I have zero budget. How am I going to do this? So I created Battle of the Bands because, you know, every kid loves music. And I went, all right, I have $5. That was my money. I used it to buy a roll of tickets and everything else I had to do exactly like what you're describing. I had to sit here and go, how are we going to make money? So I charged the kids $5 to just get up and audition. And then they got, you know, some, some kind of a prize, something like for that. Um, the top prize was full sale was uh, one of the judges and they were giving a um, recording studio um, a weekend to record whatever music they wanted to. And we had, let's see, what else? We sold prom tickets. So I had sponsors on the program. I sold the tickets uh, to people to go see the bands. And then there was an audition price. I, I don't guess people should have to pay for auditioning, right? Uh, they do. Really? It's called okay. pay to play. Yeah. Okay. So I had to raise um, $45,000 to have a prom. That was ridiculous because that was more than a teacher makes, still makes. And I just went, that's crazy for that much money to be spent, but I did it. And so I learned a lot from that. And music is a good industry to be in, was my impression mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. Questionable, but yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. So like, I don't do it as a living like you do. Um, where did you go to school, whether high school, college, whatever? I went to college, uh, Mercyhurst up in Erie, Pennsylvania, which was a very I've predominant, um, it's the size of Rollins College. Yeah. And, Is uh, it private? 
it's a private Catholic school, very, you know, a lot of nuns. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it was very cool because I was not a very good student. So having a small school with small classrooms, I persevered my four years and graduated in with uh, business management and hotel restaurant management. Oh, that's interesting. So Barry University is also a Catholic school. They had nuns that run that one still, yeah. I think somewhat. So uh, maybe they're the same size. No, I think Barry's pretty big. Yeah. yeah, Barry's way bigger. Yeah, way bigger. Okay, so you went to school, you got management, hospitality, that's super good. Um, what other background and industry? So you started at 16 and so you put the pieces together? Um, it's just, I was just, you know, being around my father, who's very entrepreneurial, I was just very entrepreneurial. And uh, my father's friend opened a club in Orlando, Florida. So I was the only one out of my class that graduated that didn't go to like Hyatt or Hilton or Holiday. And I went to an independent nightclub that was the biggest on the East Coast um, down in Orlando, Florida. And that's how I got to Orlando. And then when I got here, I realized that no one was promoting any live concerts. And so I started digging in. Um, and started doing live concerts the minute I hit the ground here in 1983. So where were people doing concerts at that time? At the little closed, like the Beecham at that? Or did you do them outside in arenas? No, no, we did them. I was more into the punk rock scene. So we were just doing mm. regional um, up and coming bands because it was a very, just, a, it was a brand new scene. Um, so Orlando was very, um, they had the uh, Eddie Grant Sports center where, you know, all kind of iconic artists played there from the 60s and the 70s. Um, but there wasn't a kind of an, what I call the underground independent concert scene. Mm -hmm. You had the big Citrus Bowl where like the Rolling Stones played and Tom Petty and they didn't really have the smaller independent music scene. Yeah, the indie thing going on. Well, industry. So you have multiple industries that you've worked in. I know some of it, you said hospitality. That's certainly on the event side of it, mm -hmm. but you were also a chef, right? Uh, I, I, that, Not formal? It, well, no, I don't think, I don't even know if, what a chef means. I, I grew up cooking in restaurants and I own restaurants and you cook within your... What you know. Yeah, and uh, I think with. Anthony Bourdain was very good about describing the difference between someone that runs a, a kitchen and cooks and knows everything and someone who says they're self a chef and I'll let that, I won't take sides on that one. Mm, That's yeah. for damn sure. Yeah, I know that uh, I've had some uh, people I know that they'll call them a themselves a chef. They didn't go to the formal training to do it, but they were, I honestly would hold them up against anybody else because they had the knife skills. You can pretty much learn a lot of that same information on YouTube and just by practice without going through the formal degrees. So I feel like you can call yourself that if you're of that caliber of creativity, I would think. Yeah, I mean, I, my thing is, I just don't really believe in titles of anything. So I don't believe in, you know, titles. I just think that you do what you do, you do the best you can do, and you just move forward. But I don't think you need a title underneath your name to, unless you have a, an ego that you need to fulfill, which I don't. Well, society likes titles, right? Because that's how we tend to categorize and, and put people and understand what they do. So I think that there's a place for titles just to better understand and communicate in the in the workplace. I think that you know put yourself in a box then. So I was a really good busboy also, besides being a really good cook. Yeah. Mm. Favorite thing to cook? Ooh, that's a tough, really tough one. Uh I really I cooked everything so my I, the different restaurants I owned one was Italian restaurant one was like an all-american restaurant one was a New Orleans Cajun restaurant and I just like to dip my finger in all the different stuff but there's not one particular thing and I think if you talk to any restaurant owner the one thing they don't do is cook at home so you're so burned out from cooking you don't have a restaurant. signature dish no um lasagna I saw a lasagna recipe the other day I was going oh my god I want lasagna that was yesterday. So you eat more veggies than meat, right? <laughs> Would that be safe? Because it's not vegan. It's not. Ve yeah. Yes. But yes. But I'm not a big. I don't like. I don't like categories. You know. That's why I don't. I don't like. When you say you're a, a vegan restaurant or a vegetarian restaurant or whatever kind of restaurant. I think if you do a good job and you cook good food and you look at the restaurants in Orlando, 
that do a really, really good job. They're not trying to pigeonhole themselves into a certain category. Mm. I think Dave had a question he wanted to ask you. Before I get too far away from work history, he had one. Um, well, uh, you were just talking about titles and how you don't like to get pigeonholed. How did, how did you get the title of the show king for your event planning? Well, my illustrious partner, Steve, um, because he, when I described my background, he just blurted that out because I've done about over 8,000 concerts in Orlando. And he goes, you are the show king. And I go, okay, that's fine with me. Um, you can title me any way you want, but I am so excited about Orlando World Live. Uh, it's my focus and I'm super excited for what we're gonna do and what we're gonna bring to Orlando. It's gonna, it's gonna change the face of what you think about entertainment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I know that there's a goal to hit the number of events that would be for Orlando World Live? I think the number, I mean, me and Steve have been batting, you know, 200, but talking to some new partners today, they might bring a Conchella style music festival down here. Ooh. So you'll eliminate 30 shows because now you've got a show that's 400 shows in the three days, or there's different aspects of what might come into Orlando so it's not about a number, it's about a quality of the entertainment that you're providing because, you know, some years I was doing 800 shows a year and there's only 300 days a year, but we were doing reggae, we were doing blues, we were doing jazz, different venues, different, So you know. I think how you count them, that's interesting because for me, I'm thinking 200 shows means 200 days. And what you had said just a minute ago was- I've had sometimes five shows in one day with different, from Indigo Girls, to doing um, Pato Banton, to doing George Benson, and that could all occur in one day. Yeah, I know Dave was really interested in any classical music that might be coming in. Uh, well, Steve and I met with the opera, the ballet, the Orlando Symphony, and we are trying to even do some stuff together, like merge the ballet with the symphony. And, and Paul that runs the Orlando Symphony, his dynamic is from Ohio, and he was really exciting and real, we're real excited to see outside of the box what we can, you know, create, you know, and to create, I like to create stuff that a 10 year old likes and a seven year old likes. You know? Oh yeah. That's good stuff there. So one of the questions I know was what was your first paying job? Was that when you were 16 and you were putting these <clears throat> shows together? Nope. I was 13 and I worked Whoa. in a, I, well, we didn't do, I was in the seventies. I'm old. And you, that's when you went to work. So uh, my dad got me a job at an officer's club that it was an Air Force base in Pittsburgh. And I washed dishes. And then when I went to college and I blew out my knee playing football instead of tennis, which I should have been playing, they asked me my skill level. And I said, well, I washed dishes. They go, hotel restaurant management's for you. So <laughs> my major was being a dishwasher at an officer's club in Pittsburgh. So what is your favorite genre of music out of all of those that you oh, mentioned? That's the worst question to ask. Oh, oh gosh, right? I, I, that's my whole thing. I can't focus. I collect uh, Neo Morricone soundtrack music. I like industrial music and not Nine Inch Nails industrial, like darker, deeper. I like poppy. I like, uh, the, you know, I grew up in the punk scene, the Clash and the Sex Pistols, but I also like King Crimson, Led Zeppelin. yes. Peter Gabriel with, with Genesis, not um, after that. And so, so I like all kind of music because when you're a music geek, you kind of just get into all these different weird lanes and then you go off on tangents. So I go off on tangents a lot of times and I've done so many different styles of music. You don't want to be put inside of one kind of lane. Yeah. So I like all kind of music. I like, I listen to also. classical, I listen to jazz. I have a massive you know, jazz collection with Alice Coltrane, besides John Coltrane and Alice Davis. And I'm, because I love soundtrack music, I've collected a lot of really, and Morricone was my favorite classical, it's not all classical, but, you know, soundtrack guy. So Dave is a sound guy, and I asked him to create custom music for this show. 
Okay. And so that's part of why I'm asking, like, what is the type of music? So he gets some ideas on what type of music we should have for the open and the exit, and then also playing kind of in the background. So it's going to be eclectic, and we're going to hope that you well, like that it. that word is KRCW, which is one of my favorite radio stations in California, and they play the most amazing eclectic music. It's all over. It's like World Cafe on NPR out of Philadelphia, and they play everything. So you can really kind of go in so many different cool directions and what NPR does and what KRCW does is they kind of it's the vibe of the situation If Henry Rollins is doing something they're kind of going to the Stooges if this person's doing some Beck is doing something he likes Serge Gainsbourg so you can go to all different directions. Mm. Hope that gave you some ideas. Dave. It probably didn't. Probably confused him more. <laughs> He's no, probably I, mad at me right now. I do have a question about your uh, promotion for for things like the festival that you just brought up. Um, when you're promoting something like that, are you working with like the labels uh, of the artists that are coming in? So do they all have to be the same label, or do you get to work no. with them individually? Uh, the labels are very, very few and far between. Even when I started in the '70s of working with you, they. Once they put the album out, once they push the band, it really comes more down to band management. Now, some labels, if they're trying to break a brand new band, like I did, like when Live came out, like this was like 93, 94, and their label is really pushing them hard, and I sold zero tickets. And I told, you know, their label representative and their management, I said, hey, we got a serious situation because we don't want to be embarrassed. And they, so we just, you know, we basically... Um, you know, you know, they gave away the tickets and and made sure it was a good crowd. But there's a lot of those people forget that every band was a baby band at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I did Kid Rock on a Monday night with the full Kid Rock show, uh, the midget, everything, and <laughs> sold no tickets because he was not known. So I did Jewel in a coffee shop with six people, and a year later, she sold out a 1,200 seat venue. You know, so. You know, Indigo Girls is an example. I did them from when they were in a coffee shop all the way up to they were selling 10,000 tickets. So it's crazy. Yeah. So it, it, there's no one just, there's very few bands that just start out like, you know, you mm. have to earn your keep. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So your role with Orlando World Live is not Pro just events or events and? I don't know. Producing events, sponsorship, um, uh, venue design because we're going to have a lot of different venues but also you know working in conjunction with the city and working with the different types of genre of music and get the community in and make them feel like they're part of the music scene so if if we're doing you know a reggae show or a soul show or a rock show you want to engage as much as a community as part of it and make them feel part of it and Kind of like Perry Farrell, that's how he started Lollapalooza, is he wanted to get more of this engagement with the community, with different charities and different recycling and different, you know, save the trees and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And a lot of it's cliche, but a lot of it really, really gives back to these younger people that never have been exposed. So you come to the show and you can get all these different exposures of stuff that you might have not been able to see before. Yeah, definitely. It's nonprofit organizations, causes that get supported. And the young people love that. You know? Yeah, yeah. And well, I do. That's our vision of how we want to move forward. We really want to engage the community. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, not respective of any age. I think that people do get behind causes, whether it's animals or the arts or it's food, whatever. They will get behind something that they are passionate about. Yeah. Because we're humans, yeah. So what is the highest number of events that you have ever booked? What do you mean, in a year? Yeah, in a year. We'll just say a year. I, I have no idea. I mean, probably between seven, 800. Whoa, that is a lot of events. There was a different time, though, in the 90s. We didn't have, there was no social media. So like the book that I'm doing is about, like, how did you promote a show, Sonic Q show in 1990? Well, I got in my 280ZX and I drove to Gainesville and I put flyers on a telephone pole next to a record store. That sounds archaic now, and people don't understand that, but if you lived in Gainesville or Tallahassee, the only way you knew Sonic Youth was gonna play only one show in the state of Florida, you had to drive there and talk to them and go to the record store and communicate. There was no cell phones. I did all the show bookings by payphone. 
So wow. I tell the promoter I would be at this payphone at this time on this street at this you know situation. And so. honestly, some of our listeners may not even know what a payphone is. So we yes. should probably. Well, I have a 12 year old daughter that's very confused still on how I try to show how it works. And yeah. She thinks we're idiots. So, yeah. so I felt like a caveman phone. back then. You know, well, and now when I talk about it, I felt like a caveman. Not then, because then you were just trying to work as hard as you could to promote these bands. And we didn't have a lot of bands like that. They would ever come down to Florida. They bypass Florida. They go to New Orleans and Atlanta, the New Orleans. And we were digging our heels in to try to get, especially English bands and other bands from around the world to come down to Orlando. Mm. So payphones were used to be on the street. They were probably on just about every corner. People would pay. They were in the clubs. They were in my clubs. Yeah, they were everywhere. And you would pay, you know, quarters, nickels, dimes, put that in there. No, you know, type of uh, debit cards or anything. Oh. And you would put change in there and you would call people and you had to pay more for long distance unlike on our cell phones now where like no you had to do it in two, you had to do the whole anywhere. deal in two minutes oh my god it was like a was different chaos. time yeah and then there were phones and we should talk about this that you know instead of just like touching a number on your phone you actually had to die rotary yeah rotary and people don't know what those are some people don't so we're just explaining some of the technology and how it's advanced to where we are now it was a game changer when, you know, when the internet came out because it just changed the whole dynamic of music. And a lot of it, it drove, you know, music into the ground also at the same mm, time because yeah, everybody sure. could just record music in their bedroom and it became this flood of, you know, free music and this and this and this. So a lot of, you know, creativity from the late sixties and early seventies music got lost in translation, you know. Mm, that is so true. So, um, well, that's a lot of events to do, 700 events. I can't even imagine that. There's a team. We had a team of people that wasn't yeah, like me. Just you. you always needed a lot, a lot, of, a lot of people to produce this in the right way because the oh. catering was intense, sound was intense, staging was intense. So you had a lot of, a lot of moving pieces. So I know I'm going to be dating some of, you know, my movie, you know, preferences but the blues brothers i'll go to that one where they were like stapling those flyers on the telephone that's poles. what you did yeah and calling people that's really reminiscent of that particular time for sure the people back then there was no the only way where you're in a community whether it was a like a gay community or you know uh, country music or punk rock those people figured out where to meet and so the shows were so much more massive because there was no social media. So the only time you would want to see somebody or see that girl was you had to go to that event that that person liked that genre of music. Mm. So the events in the 80s and 90s were so much more massive because that's the only time you could experience that situation with people because there was no social media. Well, what do you think the obstacles are now then? Because if Social media. It's still social media. No, it was not obstacle. It's just it becomes too easy. You don't have to search out. Like for me to find an album, I would drive to Atlanta yeah. or I would drive to places to find that one rare single by Joy Division and you don't know where it was at and you had to go find it. You could just click in Joy Division, no control and find it in 30 seconds, five seconds. Mm. So it was a lot more excitement of, of, of discovering things like mm -hmm. different music and different genres and different people going to one of my shows here and then we would go to with the band to Tampa or Miami it was different demographic different situation and it was exciting because you're always you didn't you had no preconceived knowledge of what you were going into or social media tells you exactly what you're going to be going into mm -hmm. so it's very boring to me and I don't, I'm not trying to downplay that or be disrespectful of that it's just a different mindset it's so much fun when you just go in blindly into a movie because we don't have all the trailers and every single thing that you, you see about a movie before it comes out you go into the movie like you're just sitting there waiting for it to happen mm, it's, it makes it, it's a different experience yeah yep i totally agree do um, you think that music uh music consumers were more engaged back then than they are now a hundred percent and, and, and 100%. Do, you, do you think there's any way to resolve that or is uh, to kind of remedy that that trend i'm not saying I'm, there's no i don't think there's a remedy i just think that there was a more of a, a, a thicker passion because you like you know growing up in the 70s buying albums you were committed you only had so much money 
to buy an album. Now you could just pop on one single. Like you I would listen to my it. album and just hold on to it for so long, read all the, the liner notes and flip over the vinyl. So eight tracks and, and vinyl was a commitment. And now it's everything is just so disposable so fast that I don't think they, I think certain people with certain bands, they get immersed from it. But to me, after 2006 cutoff, when, you know, when this came out, yeah, uh, I think it it flipped the switch on everything's very disposable, and that's just my sixty year old take on the situation. It also presents itself phones, which are really many computers and many communication devices. It makes people have a false sense of urgency, like you have to do this now, no matter what it is. Look at your social feed, watch this movie, whatever. It's making it. I think people are conditioned to touch the phone more than they are engaging with people. Well, like real people. I think that's the biggest loss is the engaging of a community mm -hmm. for events, because I think everybody can really pick, like, I only like emo, this, 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 and you just dial it in so much. That's only 50 people then. I was doing shows with local bands at 600 people showing up, maybe 50 people like the band, but they wanted to be a part of the scene. So it was a different atmosphere. It wasn't all about the band. It was about the community of the situation. And I, you know, that's what some of the stuff I would like for Orlando World Live to instill, to mm -hmm. get that community situation back, where you go in and immerse yourself and get an experience of all these different levels of, you know, the, the community, the, the charitable, and, and you, get, you get a flavor of all that. So you're not just driving people out for one specific kind of an event. So let's talk about some of those events that are coming up. I know you've got some. Uh, what's one of the events that I know you and I talked this morning when we were doing our Orlando World Live mm -hmm. Alta Project uh, meeting, and there's going to be some that are coming up. Said one was going to be like a networking one. We're going to be throwing axes and doing all kinds of stuff. Well, we're just we're trying to just trying to do some community events where we can kind of tease on what's going to happen, but we really can't expose a lot of that right now. Um, and the Alta project, um, which is a tiny homes initiative. For veterans, for, homeless for, veterans. So we're trying to get that, you know, um, make an awareness for that. Um, but a lot of the events, we're just going to slowly where Orlando World Life sponsors it. And then by next year, we'll then be the presenting sponsor. But one of the one biggest exciting things is, um, I donated 10,000 pieces of like uh, memorabilia to Orange County History Center. And next year, they're gonna do a four month, 30 year retrospective of the concerts from the 70s and 80s. And the biggest thing I wanted to get across on this event was about how the community was driven back then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really exciting. I've seen some of these posters also. And they're like pristine, Dave. They're really beautiful posters. I mean, they're pieces of art, honestly. Mm -hmm. And it's representative of, you know, years of, of events that um, Dave and, um, I mean, I'm sorry, Jim and his business partner have been putting on in the Central Florida community. Do you go outside of Volusia, Orange, and Osceola counties? Yeah, not a lot, but I'm, I'm like, we're doing an event down in Fort Myers. We've done stuff in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. We're doing this uh, there's a documentary coming out and this artist that I toured with Lydia Lunch and we're going to do, it's going to play at the Enzian Theater here in Tampa and in Miami and she's going to fly in for a QA and a at the end of August. So what is that one? Who's Lydia? I don't know. Lydia Lunch is, uh, she's an underground artist from the late 70s, early 80s. Um, her latest book, like Anthony Bourdain did the um, the forward for the book and she was actually on his last show actually oh, before wow. he passed away and She's a, she's spoken word. She's done movies. She's done a lot of music, but you know, on the underbelly of the New York, they called it the no wave scene back then in the eighties. Mm. So let's talk about your book because I know you mentioned that also. What's your book about? The book is just about what I was talking about before about of, of do it yourself, DIY situations, bands were DIY, like, you know, the Minutemen and their book, you know, get in the van. Like it's all about, you know, the punk rock scene was just started with just people doing their own thing and, you know, getting in the van and just touring these different cities. And, you know, everybody stayed, if you, if I promoted the show, I was obligated to feed them. They had to stay at my house and it was this total DIY. 
And I wanted to expose it to the people that are younger, like I have a 12 year old, about so easy to do this and do this and then promote this where they were literally coming into the city the day before passing out flyers. Hey, we're playing the show at this city and then us doing it together. So it was just about the cultural experience with photographs and the posters and how we did it with no money and everybody in the community would get together and help out. Like that's the biggest thing. It wasn't just me. Everybody kind of jumped in the different record stores and they come volunteer and help unload the bands and different bands would stay in different houses. And so it was a different era, but it was, it was exciting and it was fun. And, you know, and I like to tell, I like to tell that story. It's not about Orlando. It's about that era of music. Mm -hmm. Who do you, okay. uh, There's like a lot of bands that I would always ask about, but I went to three years ago, Elton John's concert. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. It was the most amazing show I have ever been to. And he's like, what, in his seventies? It was three hours long. He took no break. The band took a break, but he did not. And I was just amazed at all of that because I went, holy cow. It was, it is a show that is more memorable than anything I've ever seen. Did you, do you actually have these people still on your phone? Did they pick up the phone when you call them or? I don't have Elton John on my phone. Yeah. But I was actually at that show. But um, yeah, I still communicate with a a lot of them are going to help me with the book. Oh, that's They're going to have their take of that era, like, like Henry Rollins and Jello Biafra from the dead. Oh, cool. And they're going to tell their version. It's basically oral history, different people. And we're doing a community page of their version of what happened at that show, because Probably 80% of the shows, I never even seen the show because I was. Well, yeah, because you're having to work it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It doesn't we had security start. back then, too. So that was very terrifying. Yeah. My yeah. word of the day, terrifying. Yeah. So um, the most influential person that you've met, who do you think that is and who could that possibly be? That's only going to be my father because he, he, he he's the one that instilled the drive. Even when he thought I was crazy, like to not go into the family business and he'd fly down to come see the Pixies or my mom would take, you know, the toasters out to, to a sushi restaurant. And these bands just thought it was hysterical. My parents were so hip, but my dad was into Bowie and the Rolling Stones. So he oh my God. really nurtured me in the music and just told me, take your own path. Don't worry. You know, it's not all about the money. It's about what you really want to do. You only got so much time to do what you want to do. In your life. Yeah. And just do that. Well, I always tell my employees, like, you either run with me or I'll run you over. Because you've only got so much time. So just run as hard as you can. And if, if you want to take the easy path, go ahead. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. That is good advice. I think that being an entrepreneur is the hard. I was saying this to Isham earlier. Is the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. So I think that having the, really, the uh, opportunity <clears throat> to have parents that are entrepreneurial is a huge gift because they're not going to try and have you, you know, like you said, fit into a box like, oh, my dad was an architect. Okay, I guess I'll be an architect, you know, like following those footsteps. Well, I think a lot of that is very merit if if that's what you're influenced. And there's been a lot of second, third generations of people that fall, you know, in law firms or whatever. And a lot of that, they, they create their own path in that that way of the, what they're doing, you know, especially in architectural or stuff like that. But it's just having the having the, the freedom and your own wherewithal to be not afraid. It's very, it's very, very, uh, you know, I've been doing it since I was 22 and never had a job, like had a, a boss or a job. And you just, it's some You have just, to take care of yourself. Well, so sometimes it's really, really good. And some, when it bottom drops out, like in 2007 and 2008, it's, it's uh, it's it's rough, you know, and you got to know how to persevere and make adjustments. A pandemic, if you're a live music promoter or you play guitar, you spend a year and a half doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And how do you wiggle around that and do other things to survive? So, what are you most proud of? I have an answer in my head that I think you're going to say. I, I really, I, 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 I really, could, I don't know. I don't know. I would think you'd say your daughter. Well, I, that's that's obvious. Yeah. Like being pitch. a dad to your daughter. No, I know. Having a daughter at a late age and stuff like that. And her and I communicate and she hates all my punk rock music and she <laughs> Beatles and Queen, you know, which is okay with me. She likes that kind of music. But I did take her to a Bowie thing that she really liked and I dressed her up as David Bowie at 10 years old. So. Oh my God. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I mean, of course, that's that. But like work, I was thinking you were saying more about work. And oh, it can be any. I just always loved like taking employees and try to push them to do their own. Mm -hmm. Like I have a lot of friends in Orlando that own their own bars now. There are bar backs for me. There were dishwashers. And I just encourage them so hard to like, how can I help you get your own thing started? That's what makes me proud. I really mm -hmm. get excited still like to help other people get their start, you know? Yeah. Being that person that can mentor and encourage them, kind of like your dad did you, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. So hamburger, veggie I see that. I just looked at that. Yeah. I'm not going to answer one? that one. Okay, I'll answer it on my side. I would rather honestly probably have a hamburger, but I've been eating some really good veggie burgers and I'm impressed with what they are. There's a particular one I like that's the spicy bean one and it's wicked good. But I make my own and I think that they're awesome. So I'm just saying that. All right, so we're gonna take a moment just to recognize our sponsor, Cat5 Studios. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. All right, so we're back to our show, and we're going to talk about the future of jobs and industries in 2030. Okay, so AI, robots, automations, they're coming into the space here. Okay. Yeah. And our research has shown that, you know, the industry is getting really heavy influx with robots, AI, and automations. Um, AI robots are becoming the prominent source in popular music in terms of both generating content and performing. I would not pay money to watch robots. I want to see people. So gotcha. I don't know. What are your thoughts about the differentiation? Because I know that there's... Um, you know, keyboards, soundboards, all types of equipment where you can make it sound, one person can sound like it's a whole giant symphony. I think there's ways you can pull that off. I mean, craft work was going out with a very similar situation that would have been amazing. And I would, I would pay any amount of money to see what they were going to do because they already did all the heavy lifting in the seventies and eighties to create that music, but they're at the age where they can't do it. But the one guy that's left in the band created a situation with technology to for younger people to experience that. So I'm not against that at all. I'm, I would be against letting them create the music, but mm -hmm. he, there was human beings that created the music and they're pulling off, you know, but I think that uh, David Bowie or Gary Newman or these kind of electronic artists would like to see it further go on in, in a way that they've created this music and to keep it going, like like Todd Rundgren talks about that a lot because he's done such a prolific production, been in being bands though, that I know that, you know, when you get to an age um, that you would like to see it keep going. And I think Kraftwerk would be the perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. So there's this, one of the people that was in my, my starter studio um, cohort, uh, he was creating a platform where people could attend like Coachella or Burning Man or pick something and you could do it through a hologram and you would feel like you were there, that you would actually feel like you were there with the people at the concert. Um, what do you think of that? I, I really, you know, that would be that guy answering that because I'm not age related to that and I don't want them to join you, that. Isham. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. His age bracket, he would have a different take on it. I'm 60, so I would not enjoy that because I've been in the middle of more mosh pits and got punched out more than punk rock shows than anybody. And I would never lose that experience ever. So yeah. I would prefer to go and get my teeth knocked out than do that. So Yeah, I would agree with you. What about you, Dave? Uh, yeah, I like, I like going to the, to the live events Real and feeling thing. the energy, yeah, feeling the energy from everyone. And it's, it's kind of, it's kind of part of the whole, whole experience. Yeah. So Isham, what about you? Real concert or hologram? Okay, real concert rule. We all agree. We want that experience. We do not want to. I go think there's, but also I think there's certain styles of music that that could apply to. I just don't think you can. You have to just, you know. I think in the classical musical world, in a soundtrack musical world, or in ballet or operas or whatever, that could be something that is really cool because 
you just want to see it and 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 hear it. So you so, don't have to, you know, but there's certain elements of the music that I grew up with that I, I want to feel it. And mm -hmm. I could feel it if I want to this Italian opera. And if I had the experience of fit, feel like I'm sitting in Rome watching this amazing situation, I'm in. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. I like the the part of actually, you know, sitting next to a person. So I'm extremely experiential. I've never sat at a show, I don't think ever. Yeah, I'm very experiential. So when I went to that Elton John concert, I'm sitting there, I'm next to people. We're all buying Elton John's sunglasses. We're all standing up, you know, doing whatever the motions were that we were supposed to do with the music. And it was truly um, something I think that was magical. If I was going to watch classical music and the ballet, then even still, I would rather do that in person and be in that chair, um, experiencing it, than being in you know my on my couch watching it from home because I don't, I probably wouldn't have gotten dressed up whatever the dress is, you know that attire that people would wear, and just being able to turn to somebody next to me and say, oh yeah, I love this, like a real person, you know. So there's this part of me that I feel like, um, and you had said this, like people were really hungry for being able to go to live events now oh, after absolutely. being locked down. So I feel like there's this place where it's, people are made for relationships, we're made, we're humans that need to be able to interact and, you know, speak with people and real relationships. So I think that's partly why it's there. But there is a place, I agree, where, you know, if I can't get to Italy, then yeah. Let me be there in my comfort of my own home. I would totally see a hologram Beatles concert without a doubt. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know how they're going to bring those people back, but it's the old concerts then. Yeah. Just feeling like it is there. All right. So there was um, a large number of people that actually attended live con concerts in the comfort of their own homes, just like what we were talking about through augmented reality. And then they were actually able to experience some of what they were looking for. It's still not quite the same. They haven't made that technology where it really feels that way. Did you remember seeing um, something that Steve had shared with us? There was a, this hologram where you actually felt like you were right there with somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was amazing. So if I could, ex I haven't experienced that, but if I could actually see that, I would be able to better evaluate if it's feeling like the real thing to me. Mm -hmm. I think that's significant. So automations and AI, so putting all of the things about robots aside in augmented reality, do you see anything like that playing into how music is processed now? Is it improving that experience for the you as the promoter and the people that are putting on the events? Is there anything with like soundboards? I'm sure that Dave can talk to that. But. Well, I mean, as a promoter, you don't really get involved in any of that so it wouldn't affect the uh, music promoter is it's about you know the portal ads and security and the sound company you're paying them to do the sound you're paying the lighting company to do the lighting you're paying you know the back line to do the back line so that i wouldn't really be affected by that and, mm. and think things don't seem to be getting cheaper so that's all i would really care about yeah people can buy their tickets online they don't have to wait in line anymore yeah well that that's that's been a pleasant experience yeah that's definitely been a benefit all right so there were some other companies that were in this ai space amper music they're a cloud-based plat platform they process um the creating of music for video games or movies and they use ai to help with generating the algorithms that come across to create the music and the genres and styles that are used in the games. Because actually, you know, a lot of our phones that we were just talking about, they're collecting all of this data about us, massive amounts of data to see, well, what music is it that people really like in this movie? And some of the movies that I enjoy seeing, whether it's movies, games, or whatever, it's coming back and it's always pulling from like the 80s and the 90s and some of the 70s and you know, some Louis Armstrong, you know, all of those super popular songs that we, we've we heard a lot of, and they play them in commercials. I don't always hear some of the newer um, artists being played. So I feel like what is really being used in that AI space is just pulling in data, lots of data. What do people like? What are they listening to? Who will they go and see? And then they're using that to determine how we will be marketed to. I think it's more of the marketing than it is 
maybe the experience. Dave, you have an opinion also? Um, I, th I think it's, it's just a tool uh, that can help musicians come up with content quicker um, using those algorithms and things. But I think you still need an operator to get to get something that's creative enough to, to go with new projects and things like that without it sounding kind of redundant. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's just so, my opinion. So do you have any closing thoughts on that? No. All right. So do you listen to lyrics or do you just listen to the music? Because this is a question that Dave told me. He, he likes to compose music and he also does sound, sound effects, but he doesn't really listen to the lyrics is what he is telling me. What about you? I mean, when I was younger, the bands that influenced me when I was younger, more progressive rock bands, the lyrics were very deep and I enjoyed trying to figure out lyrics because you'd read it or, you know, like the Who, Quadrophenia mm -hmm. or Tommy or, so it, it's, you know, but then I'm a, you know, I listen to Brian Eno every morning because it's there's no lyrics. It's just it's just soundscapes and music, and it, I like I like music that will challenge me. Mm, that is good. So, uh, what do you think? Is there going to be any? Are there will will there be more jobs in the future, or what will those jobs in this uh, space of entertainment look like? Oh, I think there's going to be just a, a plethora of jobs in any field right now. <laughs> but uh. Uh, I think if you look at the scale of even full sale, which is the biggest, you know, that's where school. Dave goes to school. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I was here when they first started and I was uh, met with Wynn Davis last week. And uh, if you look at the scale and I, they probably got a hundred percent job placement. So I could see safe to say that if you do a good job and you want a job in the music industry, you could walk out of full sale and get a job. Mm. There's so many different places, categories, Things that you can fit into worldwide that anybody right now that doesn't want to work does not want to work yeah that would be true how about the industry do you think uh, what changes do you think will the industry in 10 years you have any thoughts because there is no right or wrong it's just no i industry. understand that um i you know i would just like to see more you know and they're, they're trying you know you look at the rolling stones I and mean, mick jagger just turned 78 on sunday and no they're, way. they're still relevant and they still sell out, but I, I'm scared there's not a lot of true rock bands that uh, I don't filling know, in the void. Know, yes, in the next wave. So because yeah. we're 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 very quickly running out, and I you know I mean I just the Blink 182s and Green Day just don't hold a glass of water for me personally. So I I don't see them being like the Rolling Stones or. But there's there's a lot of bands out there that could potentially be that, but I don't I don't know. I I would just like to see more uh just more like really in, more intense production and really, really good shows. I'm not a big festival fan because it it's really is a major disservice to the band because it it'll it it, it bands just don't like playing festivals. They get can short time that, mm -hmm. that everything's running behind and the equipment's not the right equipment. So, um, you know, festivals are just really, really, really rough to do. And they're really rough to, for the, for the artists themselves. I like to see more, like, even when they did that, which I can't remember the name of it now, when they're, they're all girls tour, when they, when they, with Sarah. McLaughlin. Yeah. Yeah. And stuff like that, where they give the artists more the time to I breathe. Think Jewel was in that one too. Yeah, it's just yeah. more time to breathe and play. I would like to see more festivals like that that's throwing in 500 bands and just making it into a big, you know, there's certain genres of music. Like they used to do this thing called All Tomorrow's Parties in London, where it was handpicked. The bands got to play a full set and was very well produced. And I'd like mm -hmm. to see more mm -hmm. things that really give the band as much enjoyable experience as the people coming to the show because it'll make the value of the experience a lot better. Mm. Well, I really, really want to round that really bad. Yeah, that that is true because I personally, what I think has made uh, social media has made it easier for people to go and what they're hoping is to be discovered and picked up when they are on YouTube and they have their own channel or if they're on Facebook and you know where the video channel is. So they'll play their music, but those are like individuals. I don't see like really bands out there that are trying to 
get picked up that way. And then there's like shows like America's Got Talent, which, you know, a lot more followers and you can definitely be seeing that you have it. But some of those shows are also showcasing kids that are like five or 10 and they have the most amazing voices and they can sing. And hearing the stories, I think is what really, you know, pushes somebody out there even more. The story behind why they're doing it. There's been, you know, people like one woman who was deaf and she would take her shoes off so she could feel the vibrations of the music as she was playing, um, I believe it was the violin. I don't know if you know this one or not. And then she was also, um, she was able to sing. And I, just, I was never no, in that, it wasn't that a violin. Whole, like genre of that stuff at all. Oh, this is just something I saw, it was like last year. No, I mean, any of that kind of like, like I haven't had a TV in 20 years, so I, I don't yeah. relate to the, the, the all those competition type things. I never, it's not my cup of tea. I, I don't either. I don't have a TV and I haven't had one in like seven years, but I'll watch it like on YouTube or on, oh, I gotcha. yeah, okay. or on my feed on Facebook to see like what, what is the entertainment that's out there that people are watching. So that's really where I get exposed to it. But, you know, nonetheless, you know, I find it interesting as to how people are trying to get their, their name out there or their message or whatever it is, you know, that they're trying to share with the world. So, Jim, mes best mentoring advice that you would like to share with our listeners? Um, I mean, I think it's what I call the common sense factor. It's not about mentoring in the music or owning a restaurant or any kind of job. Is You just have integrity. You have to really, really like what you do. If you really don't like what you do, you shouldn't do it. It's just, it's, mm. uh, it's just you know, it's not all about money. It's about quality of life and quality of your brain every day when you wake up. Every day I wake up. I'm in a three point stance and I can't wait to start today because I'm in my own domain. I could do whatever I want. And I keep driving and driving and driving because mm -hmm. I enjoy what I do. And I am surrounded by so many, especially young people that hate what they do. And they, it's a grind. And then and they, they, they put themselves in a situation to me over laziness and not trying to do something outside of the box and take a little bit of a risk. You yeah. Know? Taking the risk. It goes back to that word that you described yourself, fearless, you know. So being fearless yeah, is what um, you would say. Yeah, being fearless. Well, you know, and, and, and there's a lot of failures. I've had failure I mean, is a good teaching tool. I mean, I'd probably say, you know, 70% of the shows lost money or had one kind of failure about other, but when you come out of it and you do an, an amazing show and everything, all the stars hit and everything's good and that's great, but you know, um, you, you got to take the the failures with the with the success and just mm -hmm. keep, you know, moving forward. So, how can our listeners find you? Email, social media. What would I'm, you like? To I'm share? I'm unfortunately not on social media, uh, but uh, email, and uh, so I'd be more than happy to answer anybody's question. And can you provide the email address? Like, to, oh, we sure can. I mean, I'm just on the. Like on the podcast thing, I'm saying, oh, yeah. saying it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll put it in the uh, show notes. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'd be more than happy to mentor or help anybody that wants to get in the industry. I've helped a lot, a lot of people do at Full Sail and at Rollins College, and people that are going to Rollins but just were interested in how to like promote a concert or how to get started in it, you know. And they can follow me, and a lot of them, they're like, "Wow, they didn't realize you start at seven in the morning and you're going till three in the morning." And I go, "That's." a concert promoter does yeah it's a lot yeah. of work it's a lot of work and it's long hours yeah it is it costs a lot so we want to take a moment to thank our sponsor cat five studios thank you to our production team elizabeth herbert associate producer um our video and audio intern steve nice raymond ahmad khan mitsari rosales vargas and we have isham johnson over here behind the cameras today and our sound and music that is Dave Francis. So employers, please visit us at Intern Pursuit, www.internpursuit.tech to learn how you can get matched to amazing intern talent. And we thank you for listening to our show.